Hello, 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 and welcome to today's episode of Her Version. This podcast is dedicated to sharing stories of struggle to triumph, a platform that allows individuals to tell their truth in order to inspire and uplift others. For those of you that are new to this podcast and like content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you follow, like, and share. I am your host, Sabrina Victoria. Let's jump right in. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of Her Version. For those of you that are already jumping on live, we so appreciate you being here and hanging out with us. The Her Version platform is built on storytelling and the understanding that many times our greatest learning experiences come from learning from other people's stories. Today, I am speaking with an amazing woman named Lynette Phillips. Lynette believes in integrating values and beliefs as the cornerstone of your conscious awareness. She is the co-founder of the Fulfilled Mom Movement and curator space for coaching and programming for moms who want to live on purpose, centered around what matters most to them. She is a mother with a story that includes caring for her mother during her cancer treatments, processing death, therapy, and entrepreneurship. Her journey over the years has been filled with challenges, and she is here to talk about how she has learned to manage her life as a leader with an I can attitude. When uh, one of the, the biggest dilemmas that I see with um, individuals, clients, is the mindset of, you know, when we're talking about personal development here still, um, understanding it. They're like, okay, I'm open to it. I'm open to this whole thing of mental and emotionalness whatever that is. Um, however, I don't know where to start. I don't know what the first step is to go from where I am now in my struggle, in my challenge, in my issue to where I ultimately want to be. So I kind of want to ask you, you know, when you think about, you know, challenges that you've been through, or when you think about, you know, the, the challenge with your mother, what were, you know, like the first one, two, three steps that you yourself took um, in your journey to kind of pull yourself from a darkness to a light? Mm. I love that question. Um, so I think the one is very um, philosophical. And I live, I think I often live in a philosophical world. Um, and it was while I think my life was life interrupted, and I've mentioned it as that I didn't stop dreaming. So there were a lot of things that had to work around the envisioning of, well, what is the life that I want to have? Because I know where I'm at right now ain't it. You know, yeah. I am sad. I am frustrated. I am angry. There's a lot of emotions that I don't want to sit in and become embittered and they become in, like literally how I live life. And so uh, my phone and notes, like I can go back to just quick moments where writing like what I was feeling, what I was doing, where I want to, where I want to be, who I want to spend my time with. Um, I'm still doing exercises like that. Like I, my ultimate goal is every month, my husband and I have a new experience like date night. And it's like, even if I didn't get it perfect this year, we missed it for whatever reason, did we get 10 out of 12? Cause darn well, that's good. It's a lot of work, you know, with younger kids to get out there and do that stuff. So I didn't, I, didn't, I, I chose not to stop dreaming and building towards that. Um, but then I also had to enact some things. So I think, you know, the step of making going from a phone call and then them saying, if you get this stuff in, you're going to be in classes on Monday, right? And this is on a Wednesday. Those are the types of things that, you know, you, you, you got to like, I think, walk into the fear and fail up essentially, which is when I take action, what am I going to do when the door opens or when that yes happens? That's probably the harder part is we might get ourselves to the first step and then the yes happens. And then it's like, whoa, 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 backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. Because I was expecting the no or I was really inside intrinsically working for the no versus I have now the yes. What are my fears? I came home and I told my husband about 
hey, I think I'm in graduate school. He goes, how do you think you're in graduate school? Like, and, and I was like, this is what they've told me I need to do. And then we also had to then work on what were the impacts with family. I also had to make be the main one making sacrifices. And so the action I took was I would often, especially when I was pregnant with Maya, I would come home, like take a nap and I would be an early riser, which I'm not a real, normally an early riser. And I would write my paper at four in the morning and set up my day um, because that was what it was going to take. So, you know, when people are talking about, I, I might need that certification. I might need to sign up for that course. I might need to go back and reconnect with my boss from 10 years ago because I see that they're in the industry that I love. Worst case scenario is they say, you know, they don't even respond to your inbox message. But what happens? What are you going to do in the best case scenario? And I don't know that we ask ourselves that enough. Um, and then the third one was, I would say is, um, I had to take the same philosophy for my son with sports, which was, if I do experience losses, are they my, am I treating them as my learns? Cause we are constantly, you know, trying to coddle those emotions in a way. And I, I, I think coddle is probably not the words, but I think guide them and shift them of like, you can feel all the feels you should be angry if you lost this game, but out of that anger, what did you learn? Yeah. Right. Um, and so for me, I had to almost adopt that through the process of like helping him of like, there are losses that become learned, right? I'm in a second iteration of my career. That's a whole new learning. I, I don't know. I didn't grow up with that. It was like, you work a job. Don't you work it for like 30, 35 years. They give you a cake and a watch. You go out yes. the door and then, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and then next, thing you know, you go on a bunch of cruises every year. Like, yeah. That was for my parents' generation and what I necessarily saw. But for me, it was like, hey, by going and getting the second iteration of a career, I'm going to I'm going to put this degree to use. I'm going to yeah. learn new challenges. I'm going to have to do things that I've never, ever, ever done before. And I'm going to do it before it's too late. A hundred percent. I love that. As far as learning, you always have to be learning. Um, we have a Facebook user here that said a tremendous amount of important material was unlocked here. Very helpful to many. So mm, thank you thank so much, you. Lynette. I do want to ask though, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, I'd like you to expand on it for our audience is the term terminology fail up. Mm. Can you kind of dissect that a little bit for us? Yes. So um, there is actually a book too. It's called like Fail Forward. Uh, one of the actors from Hamilton, I can't recall his, but for me, I kind of adopted as a failing up of like, I'm going upwards towards, like, I always see goals as like, I'm achieving something and I've got to move up. And, you know, there's kind of like the, almost like a thermometer, right? And you're not yeah. done. You're fundraising efforts too, right? When we're, you know, church building fund kind of thing, we got to slowly get there. So for me, failing up means I might have wanted to get three steps, but I got to one and a half. And where do I need to now adjust, you know, and do certain, do certain things. If you would have ever asked me if I would have thought a work from home career was even attainable. No, I've always been in operations. I've always been reporting to a job. And then when it began to be the industry that I'm working in, even pre pandemic of like, this is kind of how a lot of this business can be done. Okay. Well, my fail up moments were, uh, you know, initially I had to learn how to run an online summit. I'd never done that before. And I did that with the ladies of the fulfilled mom movement, like start to finish. We got to market this thing. We've got to get speaker contracts. We got to do other stuff. And so there are all these little milestones. And by the way, some people I emailed were like, I don't know who you guys are. Absolutely not. And then some people were like, absolutely. I bought into the vision. Let's get on a call. And so it would kind of like the barometer would move. Um, in these moments when the ultimate goal was we had an, you know, an amazing summit. So you got to have these fail up moments where I might fall a little bit short, but I've, I've enacted it and I just didn't stay still. Yeah. A hundred percent. I agree. That's great. Um, we have a comment being open with her husband was beneficial. Many partners are secretive. Not a good idea. That is so true. So let's talk about the journey of getting my husband there. So he's kind of had a front row seat to a lot of this development and things that I want to do with coaching. And it does help that he coaches athletics, right? So while they're not the exact same thing, he understands, hey, we got to actualize people's potential. But one of the most important exercises that we've done together was um, learning his values and what's important to him. And one of his top values is like connection. 
And it's presented in such a way that it helped me change my behavior, right? So with him, if you're watching a movie, there's no other phone out, there's no distractions. It's like be so present that he can like pause the movie and talk to you about it and doing things. And I was like, God, I wish I would have known this like five years ago and you wouldn't get so frustrated and turn the TV off and do other things. And, you know, when I told my husband I was going to resign from Disney, you know, one of the first questions he asked me was, what does support look like? Wow. I always tell him that's a sexy question, by the way. I'm like, yeah, "Eh," right there. Um, Because it allowed us to both say, what are the tactical steps? We had to do some things like money wise, financial wise, insurance wise to do that. But it really, he never once has said to me, I didn't tell you quit your job, you know, (laughs) kind of thing, because we just said, this is what it looks like, some flexibility to do things. He's got the kids right now while I'm getting this opportunity here and taking them to sports. And I'm going to, you know, meet meet up with him as soon as this is done. But I also, you know, he does an extra gig on Wednesdays and Fridays that starts tomorrow. And so it's like, okay, well, what do we need to do and incorporate? So it's almost like you have to ask your partner, what's the life that you want to live? Yeah. What does it then look like? And I think especially for parents is super important for us to have, let our kids have a front row seat to that being developed. Because I think it was, you know, the, the talks of the dreams and the ambitions. One of my mom's last wishes was to um, publish a cookbook. And I think it was like her legacy because she really, she loved to cook. She was known for entertaining and everything else like that. And she did get that done. And we make banana bread from it, you know, at least like once a month from it. And the kids get to see all her recipes and my sister and I is like the prime ribs in there and just different things. And, but that's like one thing that I can say, and I don't want it to be like in a last ditch effort kind of thing. So I want them to see and have a front row seat that mommy can change her career or that daddy, you know, coaches these other sports or my husband is, is helping with football right now. He's like, I don't really know that compared to basketball and other things, but they see us and then they can allow, what does that mean for, for them as well? So, I mean, as partners, you have to challenge each other with that question and say, it's okay if you don't have the answer right now of what you want your life to extremely look like, but how can I support you? What does my supportive behavior look like? What do you expect from me with that? And sometimes it's like, I want you to listen and not solve my problems for me. Yeah. Right. So then you can have that in the back of your mind or, hey, I want you to help me save this amount of money so that if we if I walk away from my job for six months, we can do it. Okay. well, where do we adjust in the budget? Like It really has to translate into action to get that that level of support. And the more you build it like a muscle, I think it shows up more. We have we done it perfectly? No, but we've been together almost 17 years and married for 14. So um, we've had a lot of practice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 100 <laughs> percent. I um, they said uh, some of my poetry speaks about couples, importance of patience, compromise, understanding and partnership. I love that. Um, If you're listening, I don't know if this is separate people or the same person speaking, but if you go to the description, there's a a area there where you can actually let StreamYard show your picture and your name. So when it pops up, we can actually see who's talking and we can actually um, uh, voice you by name. I do like Lynette, the, um, the example that that we were kind of talking about uh, before that, as far as failing up and, you had said that there's um, a saying or a book or something called fail forward or something like that that you were talking about. You know, one of the visuals that I think of a lot when it comes to failing is when I think about being in my comfort zone and then I think about failing, I usually envision falling of some sort. Mm -hmm. So if, if our audience can envision in staying in a comfort zone or almost in a bubble and falling or failing, it doesn't really matter which way you fall. I want people to rec to recognize that because any way you fall, you're breaking the bubble. So we just want to get out. Do you know what I mean? We just want we want to make sure that we're just breaking free from, from any restraints that are holding us back. Um, And it's, it's so important to just take a step in any direction, just any direction to just test the waters, to get out um, as as, qu- as quickly as possible, um, to, to test it out, you know, and to see what that feels like. Yeah. For things like that, too, I often like to do a word association exercise and say, okay, maybe I'm with a client or I'll say, so when I say the word failure, and you got to kind of say it at just a, not an emphasized tone, but just a tone, you know, that's pretty even killed. 
And you'll be amazed a lot of times that even words that we would say like change or conflict, most of the time, some people pull positive forms of it too, just as much as they would like their negative connotation and just giving them the space to honor what was viewed as for them as negative, but to sometimes see the positive word, right? So failing for some people, it could be, you know, still a new opportunity or I tried, right? And so that word association of I tried is actually a positive for them. But sometimes I think that, again, the visual or what they envision, and then the next layer of that is saying, okay, when I say the word failure, what pictures come to mind? What do you see? Is there a sound? Is there a even a taste or a smell, or is there something that as you get all those senses engaged that can help you invoke at that deeper subconscious level? So then we can say, well, tell me what that means, Mark, because so many definitions that we have while Webster and Miriam, you know, they are great and they give us a baseline. We know that we make sense of the definitions in our lives by our lived experiences. And so I think that those are great ways to kind of take that and give yourself that starting point or what are the, the words and the thoughts that I'm even associating with what I'm asking of myself? Yes. Right when you're saying that it's bringing up the difference for me in my world between fail and quit. So a lot of times people put those two together to fail at something or to quit at something are kind of similar. For me, I associate the word quit with smoking or drinking. You would want to quit those. So I actually have like a good thought when I think of the word quit. I don't think of like quitting like, you know, a, a goal or something that I'm working towards. I think of the word quit as something good. So I love that you're saying that because it's so important for us to recognize how we, our definition. Mm hmm. That is awesome. Thank you for Because how we're going to interact with the world is going to be based on, you know, our yeah. definition. If you're that more cautious person, you know, um, I was just explaining to someone that I am having to accept that my son is going to middle school. Like that means, oh. and freedom is super important. It's like one of my top values. And I'm sure when we do the exercise with him, um, it will probably come up, uh, you know, when he's a little bit older. Um, Cause I would love to do it with him. And he, he, even though he's being raised by us, he's going to have his own personal value set of what's important to him, right? Prioritization. And I'm like, if freedom's important to me, how can I model it respectfully for his age and doing certain things? Cause he asked me one day, he said, mom, are you scared that I'm going to the next grade? We were at like at a middle school game. My husband was like coaching and I'm like, Jordan, where'd you go? Like, I didn't see you. And he's like, well, when we're at daddy's school, He's worked at this school for like 14 years. And I like went to the snack bar and for him, it was like no deal. But I was like heart palpitating yeah. Yeah, okay. and he could sense that I was so scared about this new transition. And he's like, you know, I'm going to school here next year. Like it was just such a different experience for him. And so I'm trying to understand, like, if I really value freedom, how can I also give that to somebody I really, really care about? Right. And have compassion for it and do do it respectfully that I can be served and he can be served. But it's hard. Yeah. That's great, girl. I totally get it. It's crazy as they continue to grow. I had like a total meltdown when my child turned 15 because he changed. You know, he changed. He was always, you know, on my hip, everywhere I go, my best friend, my buddy, my pal. And all of a sudden, 15, literally 15, just like I feel like on the day. It obviously didn't happen on the day, but I feel like it happened on the day. He just wanted to hang out with his friends all the time. Still loves me. Still, you know, now he hugs me. He kisses me, you know, but he wants to be with his friends. And it was a huge transition when he turned 15. And I literally cried for like all the time for like a very long time. Not like ridiculous, but like emotion was just pouring out of me because I was just so used to having him here with me on my bed, hanging out, going to the grocery store. And he wasn't down with that anymore. So yeah. it was an interesting transition. Totally.